Hi, and welcome to our monthly Ghost Town Poetry Gems. We meet as a group of poets, group of listeners, group of people interested in what words can do, the power of language, the power of song, the power of lyric. So we have poetry, we have people doing all forms of poetry, that's from oral poetry, hip-hop, up to highly literate poetry that you listen to very carefully but wish you had the page in front of you, and sometimes you can, to what we're doing now, which is, you know, preparing to reach out to everyone in this incredible time of the era of the plague through video, through online stuff. I'd like to remind you that Ghost Town also runs a very strong poetry workshop called Dancing Catfish. I do the leading of that. My name's Peter Anderson, by the way. Uh, I think that Ghost Town's writing workshops, Dancing Catfish for Poetry and Rock Salt for Fiction, are the strongest in Texoma. And we're always open and welcoming to anyone who wants to strengthen their own writing and be part of it. Another thing that we're going to be doing is we're going to be reading and exploring in a non-academic but pretty immersive way various poets, which we can call, for want of a better term, featured poets. And we thought that perhaps for the coming month, if those of us who are interested could read some of Robert Lowell's stuff, he was a pretty powerful poet. You remember his The Quaker Graveyard in Nantucket, which he dedicates for Warren Winslow, Dead at Sea. And his epigraph reads, let man have dominion over the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the air and the beasts of the whole earth and every creeping creature that moveth upon the earth. Now, I'm just going to read the opening section. It's a long and extraordinarily interesting complex poem. This is just one. A brackish reach of shoal of Marrakech. The sea was still breaking violently and night had steamed into our North Atlantic fleet when the drowned sailor clutched the dragnet. Light flashed from his matted head and marble feet he grappled at the net with the coiled, hurdling muscles of his thighs. The corpse was bloodless, a botch of reds and whites. Its open, staring eyes were lusterless deadlights or cabin windows on a stranded hulk heavy with sand. We wait the body, close its eyes, and heave it seaward whence it came, where the heel-headed dogfish barks its nose on Ahab's void and forehead, and the name is blocked in yellow chalk. Sailors who pitch this portent at the sea, where dreadnoughts shall confess its hell-bent deity, when you are powerless to sandbag this Atlantic bulwark, Faced by the earth shaker green, unwearied, chased in his steel scales, ask for no Orphean loot to pluck life back. The guns of the steeled fleet recoil and then repeat the hoarse salute. Hello to you all at Poetry Jams. This is Sarah Stevens, and I'm going to share a poem or two, maybe three. <laughs> Half 
happy birthday, baby. Happy birthday, baby. Today is to smile, celebrate your gifts, gifts of warm and sturdy spirit, heart of gold and hands that steady all whom you love, gifts of deepest loyalty, commitment, strong, silent foundations for all around you loving you, gifts of your heart, gifts of your compassion, gifts from your deepest loss. Today is to value and to be grateful for the wounded heart I recognize. In you, my heart finds peace next to yours, nestling into the spaces and voids carved and sculpted from jagged into smooth. Voids nevertheless, never, never the less. Event, eulogy and grief mingled with my wakefulness my watching in the night, no dreams to bring to this morning, no past in which to linger and cling this morning. Incredulity and mystery, life as a consciousness, time a tightly wound labyrinth contained within omnipotent present. And last, I do not crave the lesser life. Never a fan of hope, nor its devotee. Flimsy, wishful, seemingly random and self-indulgent. Trust rather requires a deeper level of interior participation, compels honesty, strength to endure. Hello, my name's John West. I have a few poems I'd like to share. Uh, the first one comes out of my experience as being a child and listening to certain children's rhymes and stories. It's raining, it's pouring, is the title. It's raining, it's pouring, my old man's adoring, wants me bad, he said, to be with him till dead, or he can't live another morning. He's raging, he's rambling, my old man's been gambling. He fell into bed, dead tired, he said, rolling bones all night till morning. He's shouting, he's snarling, my old man's no darling. He backhanded my face, then trashed our place. I'm scared he'll beat me without warning. He's lying, he's scoring, my old man's gone whoring. When he comes to bed, drunk and loud and mad, and won't look for work this morning, He's puking, he's writhing. My old man is crying. The bar fight cracked his head. Dumped off, he crawled to bed. And I've heard him moan all morning. I'm waiting, he's stiffening. My old man stops breathing. No more fear, no more threats. Nothing left except regrets. And debts that seem never ending. It's raining, it's pouring, my old man is burning. He won't be remembered for love or any kindness rendered, and I won't dress for his mourning. My second poem comes out of my experiences writing some elegies for people I know and have cared about and think about. Perhaps it's my own age, but Elegies um, seem appropriate. This is While Standing on Your Head. I called you last month only to hear the same requests for message, name, and time spoken by a disembodied voice of someone I don't know, nor ever will. You never called me back, and weeks later, a message from the college where we both once worked announced in passive voice you'd have counted off for your death and when and where you're buried frankly i had expected more a pyre set ablaze and heaved out to sea or else death by spontaneous combustion now i've learned you're vertical head below 
tucked into a dirt nap, is what you've said. While above you a young oak, its roots tickling your toes. From our third poem, um, I've drawn on a couple of sources, uh, one of which is uh, from the doors. Cities of the Plain, or You Cannot Petition the Lord with Prayer. One suffered the wrath of God by fire, the other felt his fury by wind and rain, said those who blame our human stain. Pointing to their Bibles, now you feel God's ire. See what he has done to that Sodom of the North, its twin towers, symbols of unnatural lust and greed, destroyed, and the big river to that Gomorrah of the South. He overflowed it, denying his grace so all might heed. Do you not know, they said so long and loud, because of man's perversions, he let one burn. Because of man's diversions, let the other drown. Our Lord is mighty, our God is proud. Obedience may never waver, away from him never turn. Praise his chastising rod, bow to his majestic crown. Each day scourge yourself of each day's shame. Penitence be praised, but never forget who it is we blame. Good works stand for nothing, even prayer is nothing too. Hosanna in the highest, may his highness overlook you. Then they asked for a donation to keep their ministries strong, promising prosperity to the right-minded, not those wronged. Jesus is barely a mention, though his face is on their shirt, given everyone who pledges generously more than just their tithe. Not for them, the ragged people, nor for them, the salt of the earth. Love your neighbor as you would yourself. Aren't words they live by. Hi, my name is Sadie Mejia, and I will be reciting a poem I wrote called Realm. Delve into the realm of the unknown, unbiased, and unjust. Feel the real and know what's what. It may be a surprise to acknowledge the demise of what you once knew to be true. The truth of the matter is hazy, or am I just lazy? What surprise will life show me to surpass my ego's mass? I'll lay in the grass while I imagine the life I yearn to live. Hand me some mead, and I will ponder where one's yonder will lead. And I am going to recite a poem I wrote called Mother Nature. I want to stick my hand in the earth, revel in the beauty of the nature I feel between my fingers. We live with her as she nurtures us, she is our great mother, Mother Nature. Rigid, fragile, graceful, powerful, life and death is what she holds. Power of harmonizing into a melody we call our universe. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm going to read three poems today and um, they're fairly recent. Um, so I guess I'll just start. Time is a millstone that never stops grinding seeds of hope into smithereens. Space, an illusion, ever expanding past all matters unseen. Why are we doing this? Where are we going? Does anyone know who we are? Why should I care what anyone tells me when I don't understand why I'm here? What is matter? What is anything? Why do I think so much? No one has answers that satisfy questions. What is the meaning of truth? The second one um, has a title, and I've actually read it here before, but I don't believe it was recorded, so I'm sharing it again. It's called Daily Bread, and it's a sonnet. So we did talk about it before. 
Morning brings the sunrise and the bird songs of day beginning in this world, spinning past the can of any words visions of our planet could unfurl. Around midday, when our sun travels past her zenith, pounding earth with radiation, we raise our shaded eyes and dream of lasting heaven with its feast of consolation. Evening brings another feast to us, shimmering desires of the day, fragrant morsels of delight flash into dreams and imaginary play. Sleep brings a sham of peace, surreal, bizarre, every new day opens in the dark. Okay, and then the last one is called, and this is actually a song lyric, um, and I'm still working on the melody. This is called How to Judge and Why. Take a green leaf and weigh it on your tongue. Take a blue egg and crush it with your teeth. Take a small sip and hold it in your mouth. Now, do you know who to judge? You'll never know the reasons that I cried. You'll never see me leaving to hide. I don't care how long it takes us to find. Love is the only way to answer hate. Take a silver cloud to wrap around your head. Take a brown branch, nestle it in your hand. Find a blue storm, wear it on your face. A judge puts everyone in their place, everyone in their place. You'll never know the reason we all die. You'll never hear me whispering goodbye. I don't care how long it takes us to find. Love is the only way to answer hate. Catch a red butterfly and pin it to your wall. Make a magnolia reef and nail it to your door. Now can you find what you were looking for? Can you find what you were looking for? You'll never know how many times I cried. You'll never feel me turning aside. I don't care how long it takes us to find. Love is the only way to answer hate. Thank you. At some of the poetry gems, after I've read one, maybe two poems about the South African liberation struggle that I went through, uh, people have asked afterwards if I could read a group of poems which would give some sense of an arc in the entire struggle. And I gave this matter a bit of thought and I have come up with three poems that I think do fit together. The liberation struggle is intensely difficult if you were white and against a white nationalist government. White supremacism I needn't reiterate to anyone here is brutal, it's dehumanizing, and it's vicious. I think that there are certain parallels all over the world at the moment that bring this to mind. So that the struggle against apartheid is a continuous struggle. The shooting of a young black man in Georgia very recently brings up the connection that comes after colonialism the whole Western thrust across the entire world and what it has left behind. And somehow as writers, as poets, we're involved in this. This is part of what we have to work on in trying to develop the conscience of our countries. Here's the first of my poems, which I call Trigger Point. I hear that after the funerals of those already killed in the townships, youths taunt the cops. Cops in their caspers, it's armored cars, sit back and wait cradling their rifles and cracking the odd joke. 
kids run across the empty dirt streets holding up sheets of corrugated iron thin as water between themselves and the guns crying me shoot me cops and the cops as if it clinched something do the second poem <clears throat> excuse me is called if I shut my eyes and I begin with an epigraph taken from one of the street placards that the young people who were fighting the immense might of the South African police and indeed later the army used to carry. The placard read, we are a new generation. We are not afraid to die. Often enough, I've imagined my own funeral, all heaps of creamy magnolias smothering the coffin, itself a magnificent piece of furniture, and the smell beginning, and a single blundering fly who despises everything but funerals alighting on my bony forehead. Then too, the Tonnies aunties in their special church hats, crying or peeping through their fingers in suffering and trying to figure the costs. The minister's pronouncements full of anguish as he tries to calm the congregation down with promises deader even than I am from his pulpit in the suburbs and the hot red earth where they lay me finally to boil in the dark. So much for me. Sunday. Today in Quatema, New Brighton, Dembisa, Winterfeld, Alexandra, KTC, they're burying the dead. I know, but can think of it only with disbelief and dread. I could smash my head against the wall and cry out to God if the only answer weren't this ringing emptiness, stupor, placidity of my neighbour watering her lawn. I see the parched, scuffed grass and dust bowl of a stadium like Orlando, where red or black, green and gold, flags lie draped across the cheap and blatant coffins. No flowers, except one plastic everlasting wreath. And girls like bridesmaids in little veils and elbow-length gloves, who stand at intervals along the rows of the dead. The grandstand is choked to capacity. Viva! The crowd surges, banners unfurl while through the echoing ricochet of loudspeakers, orators affirm that the people shall govern. And even the sweating priests lead the masses in hymns to freedom, as gaunt the swollen-faced comrades shoulder and carry the coffins and strike at the sky with their fists. I think. I imagine. Here in my room, the bed stiff and comfortless with its spread of newspapers, if I shut my eyes, I'm stifled. The child's kite, cut out of newspaper, hovers over a rutted township street somewhere, capsizes, loops head over heels, and dives right under the wheels of a Caspia as the killers roll in. I know, 
If I could see my own coffin in the middle of a stadium and the thousands outnumbering death, searching for life, viva, I would scrabble for stones too, as the children do. But since I am who I am, all I really see is this ragged, nameless body crushed and lying huddled in the street with a few sheets of newspaper half over it and a face already gathering flies. Now that final poem that I want to read here is quite an extraordinary, draws in quite extraordinary circumstances. It comes from a real situation where a group of dissidents had gathered in the neighboring kingdom of Lesotho, which is completely landlocked inside of South Africa. They were pursued by the South African army and everyone was shot dead, except for a small child. Her name, quite an extraordinary name, is Phoenix Quinn. So I dedicated this to Phoenix Quinn, and years later, through Facebook, <laughs> Phoenix Quinn connected with me. So here we have a real Phoenix-like resurgence. The poem's called Key to the Kingdom for Phoenix Quinn. The child has dark eyes and a shy way of putting her head to the shoulder of the worried rescue worker who tries to explain to camera that the mother is dead, the father is dead, the gunman unknown, but they shot up the party, the Christmas party, the same night I was at carols by candlelight in the park with my children on my knees. And my wife said to me, it takes you back to your own childhood, doesn't it? As the Salvation Army raised their splendid brass in the rain. Behind them, the lake, brilliant and with dark lights shaking across it. And the minister, who had exactly my name, proclaimed through the whoop and whistle of a microphone that the child in us held the key, the key to the kingdom. And if only we would kneel with him there and repent right then, he would guarantee us all peace on earth and goodwill to men. But the child in me looks now at the child with gleaming eyes, whose parents have been shot by unknown assailants and I know now that Christ was no better than this child and this world shall be changed for her sake.